arguments there too. Well, I guess we're up to Andrea. Would you like yes. to introduce yourself? Thank you. Can everyone hear me right? Very good. Excellent, excellent. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Andrea and um, I'm joined by my colleague Alexa who's also on this call. He's in Sydney and I'm in Canberra. We both work for uh, PwC Skills for Australia. Um, so thanks for having us in, in this slot here and I'll just, oh, thank you so much. You beat me to it. I was just going to ask Christopher to <laughs> hear our presentation. Um, so how would like to sort of um, utilise our slot um, in, in this meeting is that I will give a bit of a overview and rundown of um, who PwC Skills for Australia is, what we do. And um, we also um, have some questions to ask members um, in at the end. Um, so uh, I would then probably ask people to come off mute and uh, we would welcome um, a good discussion about electric, uh, battery electric vehicles. So if we can just get on start get started on the presentation, Christopher, if I can ask you to go to the next slide for us. Thank you. So um, PwC Skills for Australia um, is a skills service organisation, one of six in the country, and we operate on behalf of the Commonwealth Government Department of Education, Skills and Employment. Uh, skills service organisation uh, was established in 2016 um, and we have over nine industries that we service. We are industry-led and we work hand-in-hand -hand with our industrial reference committees, um, which are committees that consist of uh, subject matter experts, business owners, uh, independent shop uh, owners and car repairers and registered training organisation and other governmental agencies um, and unions. And so um, in collaboration with the industry and industry reference committees, we look after um, vocational education and the training packages. If I can ask for a next slide, please. Thank you. So the purpose of our organization is to look at um, vocational qualifications, um, units of competencies and skill sets, and to ensure that the training packages um, sort of reflect employers and students and business needs now and in the future. Um, so in order to do this, um, we engage with stakeholders on a regular basis, and that includes employers, uh, again, registered training organisations, um, providers, um, engineers, um, new startups um, across whole of Australia. And we do uh, intensive research um, to sort of find out what gaps there are in the in the training package, what we need to address, where is the industry moving and, and what what we need to sort of address and adjust so that our apprentices and, and the learners are equipped for future and can be easily placed in a workplace and are workplace ready. So we start with each consultation. I'm just gonna give you a bit of a rundown what sort of steps are uh, involved in the whole training product development. So first of all, we do consultations with industry and industry stakeholders across whole of Australia. Um, these insights that we gather are then um, reflected in a document that's a sort of business case that we call the case for change, um, which is a document that outlines how, why, and what needs to change in the training package based on the industry intels. Then once this uh, document gets signed off by our industry reference committees, uh, we begin the training product development and updates. So we again engage with our industry stakeholders and subject matter experts to, to help us develop um, the training package. Um, and once that's done, we progress to the next stage when training package gets endorsed uh, by the department and then it's made available uh, for registered training organizations online. Um, can I ask for a next slide, please? Awesome, thank you. So um, where we are in the stage uh, of the process that I just described is that um, we're sort of in between um, consultations um, at the same time writing this um, case for change. So again, um, it's a document that summarizes um, national consultations and recommend somewhat recommendations what um, the industry thinks that should change in the training package. So, so far we have undertaken a number of consultations across um, 
various stakeholder groups uh, from all states and territories. And um, that's in relation to battery electric vehicles um, as well as other projects. But today specifically, we'd like to obviously get your um, your opinions and expert views on the battery electric vehicles. So from the consultations that we have undertaken so far, um, there's been a few uh, key findings that sort of arose. Um, and that is that in the training package, um, and more, more broadly speaking about the learners who who are sort of studying the certificate threes and certificate fours in automotive electrical, for example. So we're finding that um, there needs to be um, a greater understanding of safety implications working with high voltage. And uh, particularly we're finding that there's a skills gap in uh, battery handling and battery repair of the battery electric vehicles. And so far, we have this uh, sort of hypothetical idea um, to propose new, two new units of competency that would be implemented into the training package that would address um, this um, battery removal diagnosis and replacement. If I can ask for a next slide, please. And this is where you have, um, or well, you will have your um, sort of uh, uh, room to shine. Uh, we would be really keen for for you guys to sort of tell us, um, you know, what are the critical tasks that technicians would need to know when they're dealing with battery electric vehicles? What are the critical safety implications? Um, more so, what are the recent developments? Where do you see that the market's going to go? What do you what do you think that we need to act on now, um, so that the learners are ready to actually service these cars. Um, and the reason why we're doing it uh, sort of now in 2020, um, though there's not a huge prevalence of battery electric um, vehicles on the roads in, in Australia, but uh, because these processes take quite some time. Uh, so we envisage that this, uh, the, any change if approved and signed off, uh, if everything goes well, would be implemented in about um, um, 12, to 15 months time. Um, so we feel like that there is a real need um, in the market and in the training space to be starting to teach the, the, the apprentices and learners now how to service these cars because if we wait another year or two when there's a bigger prevalence of battery electric vehicles that may be a bit too late because then the the technology has just evolved too fast and, and we will have a lot more to catch up on. So. Um, please feel free to come off mute. And um, I think um, I'm quite uh, keen to hear your opinions and your thoughts or any questions that you might have to, uh, to our processes or if you have anything else to add. Uh, hi, Andrea. John Kessler from Tesla Limousines and Tours here. Um, Hello. Hi. That's a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I think there's a critical need for this, for, for obvious reasons that you've mentioned, but just like in the uh, general uh, car uh, industry, uh, petrol car industry, uh, uh, a lot of uh, repairs and so on are done through dealers, but for competition reasons and so on, uh, consumer choice has been that you can select your own repairer or own a person to mechanic to look after your vehicle. Now that 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 I think will be a, a trend with uh, with EVs in the not too distant future. For example, it's a, a car a company in Germany, Sono Motors, which pl plans to to export vehicles and have an open source manual on repairing it and so on. So you can take it to any qualified mechanic and uh, electric vehicle mechanic. However, obviously, if if no one's qualified, that seems to be where the skill gap is that you mentioned. So. So for those reasons and others, it's, it's good to have certain standards that, uh, that, that can be uh, sort of referred to uh, readily. Uh, so, so consumers then as electric vehicles proliferate can have a choice, uh, not only just because at the moment they, they really stuck with either dealers or, um, or service centers from the place where they purchased the vehicle from, 
but uh, if you want to have more choice on who, who you want to get to fix or, or maintain your vehicle, someone local, for example, like Tesla here, for example, hasn't got a service centre. So if I had a qualified mechanic just down the road that, that was EV qualified, I will just take it just down the road if you didn't void warranties and so on. So, um, yes, there's certainly a need for that. And um, uh, as I said, because electric vehicles are, are in some ways a lot simpler um, uh, and are going open source as well with a lot of their, their repair manuals and so on, uh, it, it should all tie into uh, to developing a standard that we can all sort of uh, readily recognise. Uh, Andrea, if I can pop in there, I'd be, yeah. I'd be interested. Hello there. I'm interested in having a chat to you. I actually work for the School of Engineering at Melbourne Uni. I train the engineers in building and maintaining uh, electric cars and develop a training course for safety. And I come from a electrical trade training background, which is why they got me in um, to, to basically oh. teach and, and monitor the students in their build. So I'd be interested in uh, talking to you later on, perhaps, about the materials and the, the training course that I've put together. Yep. I'll give you some background. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, I'm sure we can share email address or, or something um, so we can uh, reconvene after after the meeting. But yes, we would be definitely interested to hear. Um, so um, just to sort of outline as well that there are certain units of competencies in the current training package that sort of speak about uh, safety in the workplace and when handling um, high voltages. So that's the use of personal protective equipment, um, insulated tools um, and all that stuff that is up to 1,000 volts, I believe, at the moment. So, um, however, there are sort of units that are scattered around in the training package now that speak about battery electric vehicles or hybrid electric vehicles. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, we feel like that there is not uh, like a holistic approach to it so, so it's just that learners if they are really interested in it, they can take the unit as a as a as an elective unit um however there is nothing um you know like an electric vehicle qualification um there is no holistic approach it, it, it is very you know, probably a bit more victoria sydney based other than um other uh states like you guys mentioned you know in wa the, the prevalence of battery electric vehicles or hybrid electric vehicles is probably a lot lower than than in other parts of Australia, obviously, given the, the distances they have to travel. So, so yeah, I'd be definitely interested to to hear what what you might think that is needed in the in the industry. I had to um, I, I trolled all the existing units of competency plus electrical trade safety training units and and put this training package together for the the, the schools and I also starting to deliver that to some of the other unis for that same very reason. There's just nothing yet available. Good not to reinvent the wheel and, and draw in expertise from, from AV and everybody else that's involved. It sounds great. Well, we, we try, we try. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is, a, it is certainly a very interesting space and very fastly evolving space because two years ago there was virtually nothing in in australia and and i feel like it, it's great that australia is catching up with with europe as it was mentioned before at clive um so so yeah we definitely need that sort of a streamlined um training to ensure that there's a quality in the work so so from from your perspective guys um what is it that is like absolutely the, the must, the crucial thing that no one can miss when they're servicing battery electric vehicles. Don't blow the thing up, yeah. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> yeah, I, I call it my job description being make sure they don't blow themselves or the car up. Yeah, well. Oh, the car, well, that's, that's, that's also useful. Um, have you... Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll go. I... Um, <laughs> Have you um, thought of um, panel beating and painting and so on of electric vehicles? Heating a car up that has batteries in might be a bit different consideration. Uh, I don't think we've sort of uh, gotten into that much detail. Um, just here, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, so I, I don't really know much about the painting process, but I sort of imagine in some painting workshops, they will put the entire car inside a very hot oven um, and batteries don't like the heat too much and, and, and in really bad situations you could 
end up exploding a battery. I don't know how applicable that actually is, but it's something that comes to mind anyway. They've okay, done. well, that, that's a very good point. <laughs> They've done that to my test though, Chris, but it's not like 400 degrees or anything. It's like, uh, you know, a, a hot, hot, but not, not so hot that it, it would uh, compromise the battery. It was, uh, that it makes sense actually because the the, the, um, the seats don't spontaneously combust or anything when they do it. No, yeah, I think maybe sixty or eighty degrees or maybe one hundred and ten degrees at the most, something like that. It's, it's certainly not in the hundreds. Yep. Good. I, I guess the other side <clears throat> with um, EVs that um, it, it largely does apply to existing vehicles, but I think is more complex, and that is the amount of electronics and the interaction with chargers and um, a host of other systems, which um, tend to be quite manufacturer specific, though there are certainly standards, um, but just um, an awareness of how that works. And in the case of batteries, particularly vehicle to grid and the like, where you've got battery management systems talking to a charger on a wall or you know a stationary charger, the interaction between them, all that sort of scope of um, thing which you don't have with a petrol vehicle or diesel vehicle. Um, I'm not sure what the scope of your training is meant to cover. Obviously you don't, um, a mechanic may not be an auto electrician, auto electrician may not be a, uh, somebody who services the uh, computer on a, a car necessarily except by replacing it. So I'm just not sure the boundaries are of the scope of your uh, focus, but I, that's certainly an area that I think comes to mind. I know I've approached a local mechanic near where I live that always serviced my ice cars um, and said, hey, I've got electrics now, what can you do for me? And he said, I'd love to, but where do I begin? Where do I learn? You know, where do I find out the stuff? And uh, I think John's point about having open source manuals, a lot of manufacturers aren't particularly open source because they want to keep such services as there is. Um, to their dealers and so it's hard sometimes for third-party repairers to get access to the information they need to do the job so that's a whole area as well that might need to look at mm. you, you make a very good point there Clive and, and that is a problem that we've been running into uh, not just with battery electric vehicles but other uh, parts of uh, you know softwares and, and smart cars pretty much um, is the um, the manufacturer specifications um, so the idea, or in the ideal world, uh, we would construct the, the unit and then uh, subsequently the qualification on the principles and the systems. Um, so like the bare bones of things that are common, you know, in each car or, or how batteries are, are done or how softwares work. And then um, it'd have to be up to the, up to the learner to, to sort of um, learn the, the, you know, Tesla's software, for example, if they were to work for Tesla, but then at least they would have the basic understanding of how things work. Um, so they wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have to learn from scratch. Obviously, uh, I think that the industry um, and the RTOs would really welcome, you know, if manufacturers started to share um, their specifications and their how to's and, and IPs. Um, but yeah, I, I think we're getting there slowly, uh, slowly but surely. But yeah, starting with someone actually making the first step and having an open source um, would probably be a great start. There was an interesting fault just recently with Kona's, uh, I think it was Kona's, uh, where there was an app update and people who preheated their Kona's, then the Kona died and, and it wouldn't start. Um, and if you're up with social media, you would have quickly, pretty quickly realized that this was a, a software thing, but any individual repairer being rung up about that fault, they probably wouldn't have any idea. So social media is probably going to be, be a big part of this in the coming future. You remind me of something, Christopher, and that was the Mitsubishi Outlander um, plug-in hybrid battery issues. And there was a group in, um, Alice Springs and, and um, Adelaide that were having similar issues at a similar time and they managed to find one smart repair guy at one of the dealerships that contacted Japan and worked out a bunch of stuff and there was a way of 
kind of resetting the battery. It was essentially a software issue. It was partly a battery management issue, but it was mediated by software. And they were resuscitating batteries, which had dropped their range to half or less and bringing them back up to nearly new. I uh, don't know how long they stay there, but it was a, a, a battery cycling and software and BMS issue that was known to a very few people within the Mitsubishi organization and even fewer in the dealerships. Um, but through social media, through a lot of back and forth and somebody who'd read an article and do something about something or other, uh, it got through and spread through a relatively small group there. I'm not sure if it's gone much beyond that, but it just shows there's a lot of uh, and manufacturer specific, model specific later years, apparently didn't have that issue, um, which, um, which come up and it makes for a bit of a minefield. Mm. So fr from your experience and expertise, how difficult is it to actually service and repair the battery rather than, you know, uh, someone driving in the car in the service shop with the faulty battery, not driving and being towed, sorry, um, into the service shop and they tell you, you know, your battery is flat, we need to replace it. Um, obviously, um, considering environmental and, and the costs associated with that, is it actually feasible for, for learners to, to learn how to repair the battery? I could probably uh, come in there and that, that's uh, what the, the engineers do at Moen Unis. They actually build and pull apart and rebuild their battery. But it's something that is done by a number of people in the auto industry in terms of wrecking vehicles and reusing those cells. So it's something that's done on a reasonably common basis already, but they do it without training um, and hopefully do it relatively safely, but a very naive approach to safety training, I must admit. That is a, a so common it's thing. Not, it. It's not it is perfectly possible that um, you can pull them apart, but they were in the dealers, they wouldn't do it. They, they don't have the, the expertise yet. They generally just send them off for, to their main factories overseas if there's something that's doing, pulling it apart. And, and would they not do it? Like you said, they don't have the expertise. Is it because there is no accredited training for these sort of things or is it just because it's better for them just to replace it? Uh, it's, there is, they don't train many people here because there's so few EVs here still. So it's all the expertise is still overseas and it's all done in house training. They don't um, want the knowledge being let out too much. So there's the issue of there's other people and I've been talking to aftermarket repairers that actually want to move into repackaging batteries. Um, and uh, they want to set up a training course, exactly what these sort of competencies would be about. Isn't that the case in New Zealand? I think they do that. They, they mm. refurbish uh, leaf batteries and so on. But so, yes. uh, there are a number because there's a lot, there's 6,000 yeah. or more leaves here. We have 600 or more here. Yeah. They have more than 10 times the number of leaves there than here. So it's, it's so a they lot. have quite a good aftermarket system for repairing and repackaging leaf cells, mm, leaf yeah. batteries. Some of the training there, you might need to focus on the differences between the companies because Tesla's actively fighting that on a range of fronts. Um, people that rebuild a number of batteries in the US um, have found themselves shut out of superchargers and things like that. They're tending to keep as much of that in-house as possible. So it would be important to cover that, I guess, as you do it. Um, the other things, I suppose, is it, it is, as somebody mentioned, it's such a fast-changing environment with a whole bunch of new battery technologies coming through. So you'd need some sort of hot, updatable element to um, your teaching, I imagine, on that. Uh, even Tesla stuff coming in September is likely to be quite quite different and might change the landscape and, and how flammable some of the batteries might be, for example. So, yeah, it, it, it is all very chicken and eggy. It depends how long it's going to take for us to have our iPhone moment in Australia. Um, most of the rest of the world had it a few years back, but it's just going to take a while um, for us to have a large volume of EVs. And then at that stage, um, potentially, you'll need a whole lot of people trained in how to repair them. Um, so you yeah, still to rush to their certificate three. And yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you uh, made the right comment that it's chicken and egg. I wonder if 
we don't have enough battery electric vehicles because there's no one to service them or is it because um you know it, it's just that australia is not there yet and therefore we don't have apprentices because they have not much to service really to say i, I guess it, it is different in like i said um melbourne sydney even canberra i think there is one charging station in here uh tesla at the airport um and I've seen it consistently busy uh, with the five Teslas that we have here, I think. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's certainly an um, interesting area. We, I just wanted to sort of uh, elaborate a little bit more on the technology and the batteries that you mentioned. Um, how, how different are they to, like you said, Tesla's coming up with something new? What do you envisage? Is it going to be like very, very different or is it going to be a slight modification? Um, I'm not fully up on all of it, but um, Clive and others, my, um, Charles, if you're still around, may know some of the bits and pieces, but they're talking about a million mile battery. They're talking about different chemistries. Um, but yeah, I can't quite remember the names of them at the current juncture. Um, others might be able to- You might phosphate, I think, the chemicals. Yeah. Slightly different, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know there was talk about, um, they'd signed a deal with a Chinese battery manufacturer for vehicles made in the Chinese factory, so it's all local metals and so on. Um, and they were going to be using the their new packaging for batteries first in China, and then eventually they'd, you know, they'd re, rebuild or update their assembly lines in California and for their newer factories in you know, Germany and so on. Um, so, yeah, it's very... The stuff that Tesla has said is very, it's been very open-ended. They originally were going to have it in April or May and they put it off because of COVID. Mm. But I think there's been a few leaks in the meantime where they might have applied for um, patents or licenses and yeah. those, yeah, the, the information from those has become public just in the natural scheme of things, whereas the, the original plan was probably for those things to become public after the announcement, whereas now they're kind of leaking before the, the announcement. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's going to be a big, a big change. And um, one, one comparison I thought might be with um, when plasma TVs first came out, they were so much better than, you know, cathode ray tube TVs. Uh, they're expensive, but a few people got them. And then the uh, LED TVs came out and they were even better and cheaper and more energy efficient. And so may, may, maybe all of us who own EVs now are buying the plasma TVs. You know. Oh, things might change. Things will be standardised, and, and and the thing is, yeah. no one is going to be making internal combustion cars uh, in the next five or ten years. Really, uh, mm. it doesn't make any itself. So, although we're from a very low base, uh, EV take up will, will grow exponentially. As a, a, I think in Australia, but, um, you know, there will be critical mass at some stage. It would be nice if there were some incentives to get rid of ICE cars and and uh, you know basically replace them with electric cars now, but it's not the story, but yeah, it, it will be uh, that there will be a critical mass there for a lot of the things that you're talking about would be viable to refurbish batteries and so on, and therefore the training would be necessary to to uh, to make sure that people are doing it correctly. Uh, but yeah, the chicken neck thing again, I guess. Mm. And I suppose it's one thing to replace an entire battery that is made to be replaced. Yeah, that's a, a relatively simple thing and you, you certainly need your, your electrical safety and so on. But it's a completely different thing to um, refurbish a battery, take the cells out. And that will very specifically depend on what chemistry you're using and, and how it's manufactured. And each one's going to be completely different. Um, yeah, well, exactly, Chris. There's, like that Sono and a few other cars got little, little like uh, prism batteries. You just, if, if four or five of them are performing too well, they just unplug them and plug in only replace those cells so it's 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 really straightforward and modular other 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 companies you've got to take the whole assembly down thing down and and and, and you know take the whole thing apart just to, to sort of look at it then decide what needs replacing so it can be very complex but it needn't be if, if there's standardization in the industry as well which is happening a bit i think and then I suppose disposing of those cells as well is a. Don't know what you do there. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I, I get a lot of companies have thought that right through, cradle to grave, but others haven't. So it just depends. That's, that's where other uh, other refurbishers and aftermarket people might come in and help if, if the company itself is not doing it. Um, we're importing electric cars from Japan and we've got 52 of them now. They're all Nissan Leafs and we're, we're switching out battery. Like this is a high voltage translator tool for switching out one of the batteries that we're doing now. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's probably with the changes to the import rules as well, there's probably going to be a lot more imported vehicles. I think looking at servicing those old cars is going to be really, really important as well. So at the moment we're just getting batteries from salvaged vehicles. Mm. But um, Relectrify, they're one of the people that, one of the, organi one of the companies that uh, do the Second Life batteries. They also have a battery pack, which we're going to use for the older Leafs as well to put in large capacity batteries. So, um, yeah. That's great. That sounds awesome. Does anyone else have anything um, to add or ask any questions of me? Yes, the only other thing I thought of, and I'm not quite sure how broad your scope is, but um, with the training stuff, obviously first responders and fire people and emergency people would be the ones that need the training so they don't electrocute themselves in that area sort of first up. So as you pace your modules and who you roll it out to, maybe triaging that a bit might be helpful for Mm. We, we have um, sort of t touched on that. Yes, we do acknowledge that it is a, or oh, it, it is going to probably become an issue if you're going to have electric vehicles in, in the car accident or, you know, you can't bring, just spray it with water, right? Um, so um, so I think that there are certain non-accredited courses for first responders and they do get some sort of, um, I guess, basic manual of what to do or who to contact if such um, accident happens. Um, however, yes, we, we are uh, taking it into consideration. We're looking at things uh, for the first responders as well, um, how we could approach that. There are some cars, I think, that have fail safe mechanisms and, and automatically shut off if there's an accident or depending on how of the severity. But sometimes that poses other problems. Drivers can't get out of the car because everything's electric. So you need to have like a little hammer under your seat or something to smash your windows. I mean, it sounds weird, but that's, that's how bad it can get if the person trapped in the car can't get out. Uh, mm. And, and even, even though uh, you know, it was all electric, so automatically switched off. Mm. Uh, those things come under uh, different standards for um, EVs for safety. Okay. And yeah. the the uh, the work for first responders is actually the NFPA in America, and all car manufacturers put out two page safety sheets. They have to put them out as part of the putting them on the market. So each EV has a safety sheet that the first responders can access either with or each car. And some of the cars now actually have QR codes on them, so those first responders can scan Just the code and it'll give them the sheet. It, it, interesting to maybe with these training modules, uh, look at regulations to take to governments as well to maybe standardise this stuff uh, across Australia that, that might I'd like putting a Q, Q code, uh, QR code on a car or something, yeah. Mm. I, th I think there are certainly um, governmental organisations that feel passionate about uh, safety and standardising um, these things. Um, however, like you said, chicken and egg situation it's still a while away but i think there are still baby steps are still steps forward so so, so I, th I think we will get there um but just with the interest of time um i would really like to thank everyone for having us here uh for for listening to our presentations and and for giving us your your views and, and your opinions i really appreciate that it's very very valued so thank you so much thank you for being here presenting Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. It's almost nine o'clock. Mm. That's all we have on the on the agenda that I know of. Does anybody else have anything they need to talk about? No. Nope.